I'm Janet Waters from the National School of Government and uh, here today to have a discussion with Professor Bino Candola from Pern Candola, occupational psychologist. And uh, Bino is a member of the Sunnydale Institute, uh, who's our, which is our virtual academy, and delighted to be talking to Bino today um, about his latest research, in, uh, which is around in the mind of the leader. So, Bino. Um, I think probably it'd be best if we could start with just perhaps outlining a little bit of background to your latest research into leadership, because from the National School perspective, very interested in latest uh, research into leadership. The research came about because the, there's a lot of work that's been done on leadership. I think everybody knows that. There's yeah. lots of books on the bookshelves, um, kind of quoting research, but a lot of the research is actually about the leaders as they are now um, and describing their qualities. What I was actually interested in the research that we've done recently is how did they, beco how did they become leaders? What was the journey? Mm -hmm. And I've been managed, managed to interview 24 very senior people. They're either board members or chief executives or chairman of various organisations, um, public sector, private sector and voluntary sector. And from that, from those interviews, managed to identify some of the key themes in their journey to becoming a leader. Oh, well, that's, that's a really interesting uh, perspective. I mean, so often we look at the qualities rather than the, um, the, the journey of the leader that you've been doing in your research. So um, what, have been some of the, what are some of the emerging findings? Well, one, of the, one of the main things, I think, is that careers are unplanned. Um, the vast majority, of 23 out of 24 people, uh, actually said they never had a plan to get to wherever they are now. Uh, there was one person who said from the age of about 12 or 13 they knew they were going to be running a significant organisation. But the rest of them, th their careers genuinely were unplanned. Linked to that, though, is a second kind of key finding, was their openness to opportunities and experiences. So even though the careers weren't unplanned, they were always moving. And if an opportunity came up, they would take it. So somebody would say, fancy going to uh, New York, and they, mm. rather than think about it too hard, they go, yeah, I'm going. Mm. You fancy kind of moving to um, run this plant or this operation here? It'd be, yes, there's a great opportunity, I'll take it. Mm. Um, so there is this openness to opportunity and this openness to experience. I think the third, the third key element, I think, was just about, despite their seniority and the trappings that come with being so senior, actually they've remained human. Mm. And part of that is showing respect to other people and also seeking feedback uh, from, from, um, from others as well. Mm. And one of the key elements, I mean this links into another key element, is the role of mentors. All bar one, again, actually had a mentor. They didn't necessarily recognise them as mentors at the time. Often they were just their line manager. Yeah. But looking back on their careers, they could actually say, you know, that line manager actually taught me a lot. I, I, I gain a huge amount of knowledge and experience from, uh, from those people. And in turn, they've become mentors themselves uh, to, to other people. And the last point, I think, one of the last key findings is the, uh, the importance of values and how the values of each of those people is actually a significant driver in terms of how they behave at work and how they behave towards other people at work. Okay, so some key areas emerging from your, um, from your initial research and um, from our perspective I think we'll have some read across to the work of the top 200, you know, the very senior leaders that the National School and we in the Civil Service are, are engaged with. You talk about um, careers being largely unplanned and uh, we actually seem to put a lot of effort into development and career planning. So um, interesting if you could uh, expand a little bit on, on how that uh, came about. I was very surprised. It was, uh, I think if, if, uh, if, if you'd asked me beforehand, I, I think what I would have anticipated people saying, one of the findings being consequently, yeah. was that people had a goal and they knew where they wanted to be and they just worked hard to, to achieve that goal. Mm. That they planned for it, it was systematic, it was thorough and there was a purpose to all of their actions. The, um, in, in career terms there was a purpose to their actions. What we actually found was quite the opposite. The people kind of moved from, from one job to another job. Uh, sometimes it actually took, took them quite a deal, uh, quite, quite a, a deal of time before they actually realised what they were capable of doing. Mm. Um, 
but part of this was actually taking opportunities, but also um, having setbacks. Um, and the setbacks were, 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 all, were all of them were used as lear uh, learning opportunities to be able to say, okay, what have I learned about myself here? How can I stop myself from making mistakes like that again in the future? Bino, that's um, really interesting. A couple of things to pick up from what you've just said. Um, interested in the, this whole issue about uh, mistakes and setbacks as being significant. Can you, you know, tell me a little bit more about that? Well, this, this, thing, this thing about mistakes, I mean, one of the, one of the chief executives I talked to uh, actually said that uh, he reckons he, he gets his decisions right two times out of three. Oh, right. So one, one third of the yeah. time he reckons he makes, he, he's making mistakes, small yeah. mistakes sometimes, uh, sometimes the, the bigger mistakes. But the, the key thing for him was not making the same mistake twice. Yeah. Um, another chief executive said that everybody, all leaders, need a trauma at some point in their, in their lives. Yeah. Uh, another person... Um, actually had had a very successful career uh, and then he said at 37 experienced his, his uh, a setback and so that was one of the turning points in his career. Yeah. So these setbacks are actually very significant for people. Yeah. If they respond well to them it teaches them something about the strength and the resilience that they, yeah. they, they possess but they can also learn about the nature of the mistake and what that tells them about them going forward. We look at high potential programs and organisations and talent management programs. So one of the questions you have to, have to ask is to what extent do we allow people to make mistakes? Yeah. Is it acceptable for them to make mistakes? And, and do we permit them, you know, do we give them the opportunity to make mistakes? Many organisations will have high potential programs where you will have people moved around every couple of years. So they move into a job, uh, they, they get their feet under the table, they make some decisions and then bang, they're gone. They don't yeah. actually necessarily stay around long enough to live with the consequences yeah. of those decisions. So one of the questions actually I, I would ask, I, and we're involved in talent management yeah. programs, I'm not just commenting on, on other organisations' practice but what we do ourselves, is do we actually mollycoddle yeah. you know, high potentials? Yeah. Do we protect them too much?